So I am joined by John Sweeney, um, who has kindly come to talk at the festival about Putin's Russia um, and also talking about his book, Killer in the Kremlin. First of all, this is a very large topic, so I understand if it's difficult to make a very short answer. But given everything that's been happening in Ukraine and Russia, even over the past few weeks, can you just give us, from your expert opinion, an idea of what this means for the future of Russia and what this means for Putin and what we can expect to see? Uh, first of all, let's have a look at your nails. Okay, they're a bit rubbish, right? Yeah, they? I am very impressed with yours. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I got them done as a joke in, uh, in Kyiv. And um, when I went to a restaurant um, at lunchtime, I said, how much do I owe you after I eat, eating the meal? And they said, um, no, that's nothing. Um, mm -hmm. um, we're paying for the meal. Uh, so w what I'm saying is that I am very much a friend of Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And that kind of means I'm an enemy of Russian fascism. What's kind of weird about this is we're, we're talking about this, I don't know if the camera can see it, but there's this great back, there's a whole bunch of World War II vehicles behind us. And it feels like the war in Ukraine, or Russia's war against Ukraine, feels like what it must have been like during the Second World War. For example, to be an American reporter in London during the Blitz, mm -hmm. that um, you really, really, I really want the Ukrainians to win. I want Russian fascists to lose. So what's happened in the last, you know, last weekend? Um, it looked as though Putin was in serious trouble. And what was, by the way, you've got to understand that there's no democracy or politics to the left of Putin. Everybody who says that this war is a disgrace, they get locked up or they fall out of a window mm -hmm. or they drink the wrong kind of tea yeah. or they're dead. And, but there is space from uh, Putin, who used to be a kind of authoritarian nationalist, but now I think he's a full-blown fascist. There are people, there's space to the further right, and he created this space and he created the Wagner army. And then he's kind of like Frankenstein, he's created this monster mm -hmm. who became uncontrollable. And, but the thing about um, Prigozhin, Yevgeny Prigozhin, is it, it's kind of like a cult. Imagine the Church of Scientology, but yeah. with tanks. Okay. <laughs> and the, the people, his people, the Wagnerites, they revere him and they adore him. And there's something slightly weird about all of this. But he had an intensity. And I think what's strange, and it's hard to understand, hard to get, Katie, is that he's a man who who wants to be a loyal baron to the king, but he's worried about the, the bad barons. Mm -hmm. And so, it, 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 I mean, think Richard III, it's that kind of stuff. I am a true baron, the other barons are bad. And so his, I do feel that he feels some loyalty to, to Putin, but he's horribly misled, something like this. Mm -hmm. And this turned into this kind of road crash but the other thing was that nobody was defending the Putin regime. They're all folding. And, they, and in the Saturday morning, when I um, read the news, I thought the odds were still in favor of Putin. But they, they sailed through Rostov and Don, then they got to Voronezh, and then they got within 120 miles of Moscow. Which is very close. And, and, like, and I thought, this is crazy. And then I said, I now think the odds um, are in Prigozhin's favor. And then I went to see a, a play about Ukraine. And by the time I got out again, everything had collapsed and been a deal. Mm -hmm. How did that happen? The, the Daily Telegraph had a report that the, the secret police, FSB, new name for the KGB, had got to some of the family members of the Wagnerites. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know, but a working hypothesis is that um, Prigozhin might have a grandson, for example, who's in nursery school. Suddenly he vanishes that kind of thing okay. and then he gets a phone call do you want to do a deal nothing is said about the missing i'm i'm, I'm mm -hmm. hypothesizing yeah. but something like this so i think that putin is weakened by it but he also it's a reminder that he's a pitiless street fighter you know he's not john major he's not gonna go like in 97 john major lost he went properly and quietly as leaders do in a democracy, that's not an option for Putin because he's stolen too much money, he's had too many people killed. Mm -hmm. Putin leaves the Kremlin in a box and he's not going to go nicely. Well, thank you so much, that was a lovely detailed answer and it's absolutely fascinating as you say how in the past we can kind of 
pull out some of these examples, which even though they seem quite different at first, when you get down to it, it's kind of the same thing happening. Yeah, it's like Richard, you know, just re the, the best book written about Vladimir Putin, apart from my own, can I have the crap room? <laughs> Stop it. Uh, the best book is Richard III by William Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. The, because this sort of psychotic, pitiless monster. But it, unlike Richard III, he hasn't just got a horse and horsemen, he's got nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. It's super scary, but at the same time, if we allow ourselves to be paralyzed by, by fear of Putin, then he wins. Um, so I think we've just got to support the Ukrainians as best we can with as much stuff as we can, so that they at least can kick the Russians out of Ukraine. Absolutely. Um, now, you're a journalist by trade and you're at a history festival. Are you ever conscious that you and your fellow journalists, when you're writing things like writing articles and writing your book, I'm thinking also about people like Luke Harding, who have also written books on Ukraine. That's kind of the first draft of history. And are you conscious of this when you're writing or do you not really associate it with that? Do you think that do you, are you aware when you're writing that future generations will be looking back at what you've written and using that to kind of study this period? Are you having a laugh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, kind of. I mean, it feels so pompous to say it. Mm -hmm. um, by the way, there's a man who's kind of nailing facts down behind this bang, bang. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I um, occasionally, not all the time, but you, you, um, We've recently made a film called The Eastern Front with Byline TV and there's a line from um, Eisenhower at the end of it. He said, get all this down, film it, film it. He's writing about 45, about the Holocaust, because there'll be some bastards in the future who say it never happened. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and you do feel, I do feel um, an obligation to, to record what's happened, to say, right, okay, um, so in my book, it's not just the story of the war in Ukraine, or rather the battle of, uh, of Kyiv, which I, I write for two chapters, but then I go into all the other people who've been killed um, on, on Putin's watch. Basically, they've been killed because Putin gave the orders, starting with the Chechens in 2000, then the war in Georgia, then the war in Syria, then the first invasion of Ukraine, then the second invasion of Ukraine, and then all the time. There's a, there are these individual murders or poisonings, and they include Russians in Russia, Ukrainians who got in the way of Putin's, um, who got in Putin's way, and then people like Litvinenko and Skripal who are poisoned here. Mm -hmm. And one of the tragedies is that again and again and again, the West has let Vladimir Putin get away with murder. And, and, and the true cost of that is now being paid by Ukrainians in blood because of our prior timidity and our prior greed. And so I feel it's very, for me, it's far more important to tell the truth about Ukraine than it is to be worried about what happens. Also, I'm kind of, I'm not a, you know, um, I'm a journalist and journalism isn't about working in a soft toy factory. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you for talking with me today. I'm very much looking forward to your talk later. Um, and yeah, Chalk Valley's great. <laughs>